Welcome, everyone, to another episode of, we're going to say, the new and improved Dirt to Dust, presented yeah. by Outlaw Off-Road. You guys probably notice right off the bat, things look a little different today. They look a little little, little, little different. Um, layout's a little different. Format's a little different. Um, the day's a little different, and that is on purpose. So, um, Caleb, I saw, the, I saw the Facebook post the other day. I did not realize we had like well over seven thousand views, I guess, so far. Yeah, I didn't realize that either. I was I, I was thinking we were close to hitting our five thousand view mark uh, across all platforms. We blew through that. We blew through it. And uh it was pretty awesome. I mean, in in the grand scheme of things, my first thought was, Oh, seven thousand is not that many. I'd I'd love to get those numbers up. But then I had to stop and think about it. I'm like, if seven thousand people came up to us and said, We love the show, we watched it. I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I'd, I'd be, <laughs> <laughs> in my head would be a hot air balloon. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that was, I didn't know that was going on. So we said, you know, maybe we need to, maybe we need to get a little more serious about this deal and actually, mm -hmm. uh, actually make it look like we know what we're doing. So, uh, we do got a little bit, a little bit different way we're going to be broadcasting now, uh, as you can clearly see. And we are also going to be going to more of an all in one kind of a true podcast format. Um, you know, with the format that we're doing and kind of some of the segments that we're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And we are also going to start rolling in our uh, mailbag slash lightning round kind of question segment into the end of every, every episode now. And we're going to start dropping episodes on Friday. So instead of asking you guys to tune in twice a week, once for, you know, 45, 50 minutes, once for like another 15 to 20, 25 sometimes, we are going to ask you to tune in once a week. Mm -hmm. And it'll just be an all-in-one episode. You get your fix once a week. Uh, I can't imagine that anybody would want to see us more than that. So <laughs> that's what we're going right. to do. And I think most people do it that way anyway. So um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to get going on it. We're going to try that out this week. Kind of see what everybody thinks. Um, as always, don't be shy. Leave your comments. Leave your leave your uh, you know your questions, all that kind of stuff. Because, again, we're still doing the mailbag stuff. We're still doing the questions. Um, and so we still want you guys to... To get on here, interact, do the uh, do all the commenting things and all of that. So uh, now that we got that little bit of housekeeping uh, out of the way, let's uh, let's jump into the uh, let's jump into the new format of the Dirt to Dust episodes. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take. This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to, to Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. All right, and welcome back to another episode of Dirt to Dust with the new format. Doug, I'm really liking this, man. And uh, I think the first section of the new segment or the new format that we should do is probably catch everyone up on local events and uh, national events going on in the Jeep world. I know that's one thing that we always get asked is, you know, what 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 events are near me that I can go to? And it's not just around us in the Carolinas, um, but also around the whole country. So what um what do we have coming up? Yeah, so I, I do I see that in Facebook groups a lot too. Like, oh what what events are going on? What's what's happening? What do I got coming and all that kind of stuff. So and nobody really knows it. So um I know that we have obviously we have trail days coming up, September the twelfth through the 14th we didn't we didn't push that a lot outside of just kind of putting it on the podcast and then we made like i think one um one social media post we will do one more that is about three quarters full um we are probably going to have to reorient we thought we were going to do it one way with a certain number of beginner intermediate and advanced but we have gotten a ton which i guess i shouldn't be too surprised of un intermediate so you know if you go sign up just you know go sign up uh but be aware that some groups are going to be removed eventually from the availability because as those groups fill up, we are not 
going to be able to uh, have any more spots there. So we've got that September 12th um, through the 14th at Windrock Park for Outlaw Off-Road Trail Days. Um, that is in conjunction with Rock Crawler Suspension, Revolution Gear and Axle, Next Venture Motorsports, and uh, Redeemed LED. Uh, we also are now going to be able to announce our recovery class and wheeling day at Yawari National Forest on November the 2nd with Warren Industries and Factor 55. That is going to be a free class. We don't have a sign up for that yet. That's coming. We're just now able to say something about that, but that is going to be super cool, free of charge. There will be limited spots, obviously, because we are going to go out on the trails in the afternoon and try to utilize some of the skills that are taught. Uh, we are going to have some guys from Warren coming in and teaching that, so you don't have to worry about learning that from me. Um, cause if you learn it from me, there might be some race things involved and that's, that's probably not the official way. So we're not going to do it that way. <laughs> um, other than that, we've got, uh, also in September, we've got Jeep Tastic coming up, uh, that third weekend, I believe in September, which is the me weekend immediately following, uh, trail days that is at horsepower park in North Carolina. Um, that is, uh, it's a, it's not a new event. It's a new venue. Uh, this used to be at Zootastic park for two years. Now it's moving to Horsepower Park, which is kind of cool. we got a little dirt short track there. Uh, we're going to have the uh, the Jeep barrel racing there. We're going to bring out the race car, doing some cool things there. I think they've even got a, a little short trail ride going on out in the woods outside of that. So that's going to be pretty cool. And um, then, of course, everybody knows up, coming up in August, we've got Great Smoky Mountain Jeep Invasion in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, the event that really doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, if you own a Jeep and you don't know about that, um, just Google it because it's been going on for, <laughs> I don't know, 11, 12 years now yeah, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we've got, um, and then we've got some, um, some outlaw events, right? Okay. We got some, um, some yep. gears and beers happening mm -hmm. or coming up. Yeah, we sure do. Um, so today, Friday, this afternoon, if you're in the Charlotte area, um, this will be Charlotte's gears and beers. Um, that is, uh, Friday the 12th. Um, that one is at, uh, Primal Brewery in Belmont, North Carolina. I'm looking at a pretty good turnout for that. I actually have, uh, have the guys at Charlotte creating a custom trophy out of some scrap parts. And I think we're going to try to do a, um, most represented Jeep group or club and let them hang on to the trophy for the month until the next gears and beers. Um, and then we'll see who wins it then. Uh, after that, um, we do have the Huntsville, Alabama Gears and Beers coming up on the 27th. Uh, that one's always a fun one at the uh, PBR Barbecue Roadhouse. I forget what it's called, but it's a smokehouse. Um, they do some really cool stuff over there. And then just past behind us, uh, Candace at Outlaw Offered Nashville just had her first Gears and Beers. And she sent me some videos, and that actually looked really good. It looked like it was an awesome turnout over at Tailgate Brewery in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So th all of those things are going to be happening monthly. Um, we're getting some other stores on board and, and getting them set up with a monthly gears and beers as well. But those three are rocking and rolling and uh, those are scheduled every month. They're on different days of the month. I know Charlotte is like the uh, second Friday of the month. I want to say Nashville is the second Monday of the month and um, Huntsville kind of varies, but it's almost always on a Saturday. Yeah, I, I really like the Gears and Beers events. I think they're awesome. Greensboro does a few. The, in the past, Greensboro's kind of been limited by my schedule just mm -hmm. because when we really want to do Gears and Beers is when I've been racing. <laughs> it's it's tough. I mean, you know, the spring and the summer is when you want to do it, and or and, and and really the spring and the fall in the south. Spring and fall mostly, yeah. And that's when, you know, that's when the racing is. Now, that's obviously changing a little bit with the drama, which now we have more drama which we'll get to in a little bit in Ultra 4. Um, and that just seems to be changing all the time. So with that changing up a little bit and kind of changing our focus on where we're going to be running, how we're going to be running, kind of basically changing up the race team for the 2025 mm -hmm. season, um, hoping to be able to do some more of those. But I really like those because it's not, you know, you even look at the Gears and Beers logo. It's not a Jeep event. It's nope. Jeeps, it's Broncos, it's Toyotas, it's, it's Van Lifers, mm -hmm. it's whatever. And you get out there to the brewery, drink a beer if you want to drink a beer. Don't drink a beer if you don't. There's usually some sort of food or, or, or snack mm -hmm. available. And everybody just kind of hangs out, chills out. I, I like those I like those events a lot. So Yeah, I um, do I do my best to help the uh, stores find local breweries that not only have a plenty of parking 
Um, but they're usually always family friendly, pet friendly, uh, or at least dog friendly to bring out in the parking lot. Um, usually always have some type of good food or some food available or some sort of food truck. Um, so yeah, there's a, you know, they're, they're kicking off and it's a really cool thing to see. Like you said, it's not just Jeeps, it's, it's all four by fours. And I try to make sure to be, make that very clear when I make the posts about them on social media is that, you know, every four by four is welcome. Um, uh, bring everything, what you got and come check out some awesome rigs. Cause there are, are some really cool rigs that show up. Yeah. So definitely a ton of stuff happening has happened gonna mm -hmm. happen all kinds of stuff and if you've got an event um hit us up drop a comment um drop a link to it whatever we'll look at it um if if that's if that's the kind of an event that that we think that needs to be kind of put out there we'll absolutely put it out we'll talk every couple of episodes about at least once a month we'll do mm -hmm. kind of a current events events coming up i don't think we need to do it. we don't do it every week but every time we'll now. do that mm -hmm. we do that at least once a month where we'll kind of talk about events coming up what's happening around and, and kind of talk about that. So if you've got one, you're an event organizer, you know, all that kind of stuff, we definitely um, want to do that. And we may even bring some event organizers on the show and, and talk about events because, yeah. you know, that's that's important. I think a lot of events, um, events are important and they're, they're, you know, performance does it, aftermarket truck does it, you know, drag cars do it, Mustang mm -hmm. groups, they all do it. And it just, I don't know, it just seems to make more of a community out of people, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely. Which could be good, it can be bad, but I think it's mostly good. So, um, definitely got a lot going on. So, that's where we'll leave kind of um, so on the event stuff. But I do want to get to at least, rather than just kind of picking a topic and going over it for 45 minutes like we have done in the past, I know you've got an idea for just a couple. We just want to talk about a couple of things kind of that we picked out from, you know, looking on the internet. Do want to cover a topic or two for the episode of the podcast before we jump into the last. Uh, question and answer section. Um, what uh, you got any ideas for what you want to talk about today? Yeah, actually, um, there's a there's two topics that kind of go in line with each other. And I, I think I've, I've seen more than a couple times of this being posted. Um, and I feel like this deserved more than a mailbag question spot. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is how to plan the perfect offered route for your vehicle. Oh, okay. Uh, how to plan the perfect off-road route. Uh, well, you said it, you need to plan. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, that is so important, man. I mean, and, and today in, in, in 2024, you have no excuse. You just no. have no excuse. We have so much technology available to us. We have, uh, we have Gaia as an app. We have Onyx off-road. We have Avenza maps. We have Maprica. Mm -hmm. We have heck now a lot. So many of these well-known trails are on Google. I've done entire off-road trips where every trail I was on was on Google Maps. Like it's crazy. Yeah. So I think when you plan, you look at it, you look at planning from a couple of different ways. Number one, know where you're going and use an app that we just talked about. Use an Onyx off-road. Use a Gaia GPS. I like Gaia. Caleb, I know you're an Onyx guy. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really matter. Use what you're comfortable with. I'm I'm comfortable with Gaia because I've used it for so long. All of my little points of my waypoints and all my trails and maps and recordings are all on there. But Onyx, also an awesome, awesome um, mapping app. But use one of those, plan out, know where you're going. When you're planning, make sure you're planning something that your vehicle can do. If if you're doing, if you're going out in your Tacoma with an RTT on 33s, make sure that you're doing dirt roads, gravel roads, overlanding roads, and you're not, you know, planning on going to, you know, Pritchett Canyon and Moab or, you know, Holy Cross or something in Colorado. Right. You know, you're not going to take that Overlander rig up Carnage Canyon, right? So nope. make sure that you're planning <laughs> where to go, but also that you're planning the right routes. Um, YouTube's a great thing for that. I mean, I've used it. I've used YouTube. You know, look at what you're getting yourself into because for every for every hour you spend planning can save you 10 hours, you know, on the trail. You know, I like Gaia because, again, I can download. If I know where I'm going, I simply draw a box around it and I download it. Mm -hmm. I download the satellite. I generally download the satellite and the topographic, the the, 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 the generic Gaia. Yeah. Um, because when I'm in the backcountry, I'm on a road or dirt road or whatever, we got somewhere you don't have signal, I can still see where I'm at. I've got that GPS overlay of where I'm at relative to the map that I've downloaded. And I can't tell you how many times um, that I have gotten somewhere where I'm like, okay, we got to just, we're just going to have to camp here. And I pull up on my guy and I look at the satellite and I see just a mile up or half a mile up 
is an amazing camp spot. Yeah. Um, I did that, I think, every night of Trail America back a few years ago where we did the Mighty Five. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up leading that pretty much that whole expedition, not because I wanted to, <laughs> and I promise not because my ego's that big, but the organizers of the event really hadn't, they hadn't done what we were talking about here. Yeah. They hadn't planned properly, and had I not kind of done that, I do that for every trip, whether I'm leading it or not. So mm -hmm. I had already downloaded the entire route, knew where we were supposed to be, had the satellite, had all that. So it was very easy for me. And Gaia can plug right into your um, into your CarPlay. So yeah. at the time, I had a Tacoma, and I had the CarPlay, the big screen and all that. I was able to plug it in, and I was like, look, guys, I got this. It's not a big deal. And was able to find camp spots almost every night based on that, based off looking at the satellite. So definitely playing the route, definitely playing the route according to what you're able to do, and then make sure that you're taking into account um, – food water and supplies uh yeah. to include fuel you know you go on long overland trips now if you're going to your you know local off-road park then i would just say you know plan out what trails you're going to hit right and then you know make sure you got snacks because we all need snacks but if you're going on a longer trip and you know you need to know that am i gone for am i going wheeling for five hours or am i going wheeling for five days you know that kind of thing so know where you're going know how you're going to get there Make sure that where you're planning on going is relevant to your vehicle, and then make sure you plan properly. Either A, have enough of everything up front, or if you think you're not going to have enough water, you're not going to have enough fuel, make sure you plan um, to be able to get somewhere to do that. And we've talked about that in other episodes about preparedness and medical and, you know, emergencies and all that. You know, that still holds true. So I think it's all under planning. When you're planning it, plan it. That's the best. That's the best advice I can give. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you 100. percent And yeah, we did definitely talk about this in a previous episode of what to bring with you when you're going on an off road trip. If you haven't listened to that one, check that one out. That's a couple episodes ago. Um, we get really in depth with how to or what to bring and 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 how to plan for that. But yeah, I'm I'm with you 100. percent Gaia, Onyx, whatever mapping system you use, use some sort of mapping system for sure. And definitely have an idea of where you're going, where your endpoint is. Uh, even if you're just wheeling your all, all local off-road park, we'll take URI for example. I know in Onyx, I can set my route if I want to hit the D-trails or if I just want to go cruise around the lake. I can do that. Um, Onyx also plugs into CarPlay, which is really nice. Um, you can also save offline, <clears throat> which is a godsend because very often you get in a place where you don't have signal or maybe Google Maps won't load up, so you can't exactly tell where you're at, but if you save that offline, you're going to be good to go. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, if you're doing a longer trip, um, definitely plan out some sort of route where you either you're not too, too far from civilization. That way, if something goes wrong, you have a bailout point. That's usually my, like, my, my part of the planning process is make sure I have a bailout point that's, you know, relatively within a, a decent distance to some sort of city or something. If you need food, if you need water, like you said, um, otherwise, yeah, um, yeah, I just think planning, the planning process is just so important and a lot of people just kind of wing it. And for small parks, that's fine. If you know, you're just going to hit one trail and you got a trailer in the parking lot or something, that's totally fine. Um, but if you're doing a multi-day route or, you know, something pretty long or multi-point or you're, you're trying to hit, cover a lot of distance, definitely, definitely use one of those apps in conjunction with Google maps too. Cause if you're doing stuff that's marked as like a high, not even highway, a, it's like a state road or forest road. Um, that's going to be up on Google Maps as well. So you can kind of compare the two, switch back and forth, make sure you're good to go. I didn't know that Onyx was CarPlay. I didn't know that. Yeah. I've never, mm -hmm. I'm not a, I've been a big Onyx guy. Um, I got really familiar with Onyx as a company just because they sponsored KOH. Mm -hmm. They're the, like the official map company of KOH. So I was able to download some of their stuff. Um, but usually I use the Cardo Tracks version. Mm -hmm. And I like Cardo Tracks because, you know, owner of Cardo Tracks is a friend of the company. He's a friend of Outlaw Off-Road. And Cardo Tracks has all of the maps in Moab and all that kind of stuff. And then you just load it into the other mapping app I mentioned earlier, which was a Venza. Um, but I really don't know, outside of those three, as far as mapping apps, a Venza is freaking awesome because it's trail specific. You go into Cardo Tracks, you download that specific map, and they are really good about putting... Like, you know exactly when you're coming to a certain obstacle. You know where this obstacle is, where this obstacle is, where the start of the trail, the end of the trail. So for wheeling trails, I am a huge Cardo Tracks fan. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it integrates seamlessly with Avenza. 
And then for like overlanding, I think it's six of one, half a dozen of the other with Onyx or Gaia. I think it's like Ford and Chevy, right? Um, especially if Onyx, I did not know that, um, I did not know it worked with CarPlay, but I've seen both of the user interfaces. I like them both. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how, uh, I don't know how different they are on the backside, but uh, I know I've used Guy, I like it. I know you used Onyx, you like it. So I think either one of those two, especially for your longer overlandy type stuff, and then for your trail by trail stuff, I'm a massive, massive fan of Carta Tracks being overlaid into a Venza map. So yeah, I like that. But again, it just goes back. Plan, plan, plan. Just plan it. Yeah, no, absolutely with you. Um, now moving on to the next subject, which actually we ties into this. Um, we, we briefly discussed overlanding and, and trail riding. Mm, yeah. Um, something I've seen in the past, I don't know, six to eight months, I think I've seen a lot more people do what we, we dubbed the rock landing in, in a very early episode of this podcast. Um, I think people I've seen people moving away from the multi-day completely off the grid overlanding excursions and starting to do more of like travel from place to place to go wheel um is 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 uh is overlanding dying i don't know but your mic seems to be dying you keep <laughs> attacking your mic <sighs> is overlanding dying um no I, I don't think that it's dying i think that I, I definitely understand why people would think that because during covid when you had all these lockdowns and you had, you know, you couldn't, people weren't going to work. A lot of people went remote and that happened for a few years. Um, people didn't want to be locked down in cities. They didn't want to be locked down um, in certain states, shall mm -hmm. we say, uh, without getting political. And they wanted, to, and the, the, the only out was to be out. Uh, the only escape was to escape. You wanted to be outside, be outdoors. And... I don't think a lot of people were ready to go from their everyday life and their comfort of everyday life to, you know, backpacker lifestyle um, mm -hmm. or, or go full on van life or anything like that. So I think what you saw is people took what they had, you know, they took their, they took the vehicle that they had and they started basically car camping on steroids, which is essentially what overlanding is, right? Like it's car mm -hmm. camping on steroids. So, I think that that had a lot to do with seeing the rise. But if if overlanding on a scale of one to ten was at a three or a four before COVID, yeah, COVID made it an eight. Mm -hmm. um, but now what we're seeing is people going back to work. We're seeing and, and social media had its thing, had its part of it too, right? Like people oh, would go for out. Sure. People would go out, overlanding got really big. So everybody went out and they're like, oh, I'm going to be an influencer. I'm going to make money on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram. So they tell all these people about all these places that they didn't really know about. So now these people load up their vehicles, they head out, they go overlanding, and they head out to all these places. Well, now what you're seeing is people people aren't working as remote. There aren't as many people working remote. That's not a thing as much anymore. Nobody's locked down anymore. People are be able to go to this stuff in their cities, and you can go to restaurants in your downtown and go to your breweries and your wineries and your restaurants and all that stuff. You can go to your museums and your tourist stuff in town. So now the people that weren't really ever going to be or never really stuck with them as overlanding, you know, they're back to normal. Yeah. You know, so, you know, check your local Facebook marketplace for all the stuff they bought. Um, but that, you know, <laughs> that's what it is. So I think if, yeah. I think if Overland Wing was a three, it, it's I think overlanding now is just where it would have been if if COVID didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that's we're starting to see that in a lot more than overland. I think what you're seeing is it looks like it's a big decrease, but still it's still technically an increase over what it was in 2018, 2019. A lot more yeah. people know what it is. Um, and because of COVID, a lot of companies were able to produce a lot of products that I'm not so sure they would have had the funding or the drive, or the desire, the demand to do it had COVID really and truly the last half of 2020 into the beginning of 22. Mm -hmm. um, and it really started to kind of die off in 22. 23, I think, you really started to see it normalize because that's when most of the work-from-home policies expired. Mm -hmm. um, so for that three-year, two-and-a-half to three-year period, it skyrocketed. Yes, it's fallen off, but it has not fallen off to what it was pre-COVID. So you yeah. still see a net growth over what it was 2018, 2019 to what it is now um, in 2024. So is it going away? No. 
is it growing as rapidly as it was during COVID? Pfft, absolutely not. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I think that's I think that's a good thing. And and let me know if you agree with this because I think it was getting a little out of hand. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, East Coast overlanding is different. It's not really a thing. Like East Coast, I call it East Coast overlander long weekends because we just don't have the amount of public land that it does out west. Yeah. But even out west, you were starting to see certain places were getting overcrowded. Mm-hmm. Certain places were getting over visited, over touristed. So I think a little bit of a pullback is a good thing. Our natural spaces are finite. Yeah. And they're not infinite. They're not going to be there forever. And there is a segment of our political class that would like for those not to exist and for us to not have access to them, especially vehicular access. So I think us pulling back and kind of mitigating some of what the kind of the dumb stuff that was being done. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that's a good thing and leave it to the people who really want to do it. Aren't really being forced to do it by circumstance because generally those are the people. And I, and I count myself among those that are going to do the stuff like, you know, uh, pack it, ha- you know, hashtag pack in, pack out. We were just talking about, it. I was hiking this past weekend. What you pack in, you pack out what you drive in, you drive out. You don't mm-hmm. leave any trace. And I think we got away from that during the COVID years, but I think we're getting back to that now. So happy to see it. I think I think that's kind of where we need to be anyway. No, I, I totally agree with that. And there have been several spots that I know of, um, especially in the in North Carolina mountains, um, that have been completely overrun, rutted out. And now, whereas before you could take your any generic four by four can make it up some of these spots. Now they're so rutted out that you actually have to have something more capable, which really limits down the people who are able to go enjoy that. Um, the, one of the things I've mentioned, there's an overlanding group in North Carolina where they all they talk about is old North Carolina 105. And while that's an <laughs> awesome road to go ride, yeah. it's it has gotten rutted out now. Now, it's still very easy, but the whole point, I believe, of overlanding was to get away from people. And when you have that many people going out and, and doing things, and any given weekend, you're going to pass 40, 50, 60 people on 105 now. Um, not to mention every camp spot in in the state is now booked out for two months, um, which or kind more. of stinks. But yeah, or more. Um, but also what I've seen are a lot of the people that started camping or doing um, like rooftop tents or truck bed tents are now moving towards like campers. Um, and I want you to talk about that a little bit because I know you are very experienced <laughs> <laughs> in this. Uh, and it's it's not, you know, it's not a bad thing, but. Um, talk to me a little bit about the move from truck or like car truck camping to camper camping. I mean, it's no secret. I like the outdoors. I make my life by doing outdoor things, but well beyond, you know, the, the Jeep racing thing, you know, I was a, I was actually a, uh, I don't, I wasn't a backpacker first, but I've been a backpacker for a long time. I proposed to my wife in the middle of the Grand Canyon while we were doing what many backpackers, kind of a, 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 a bucket list trip for backpackers is rim to rim. They mm-hmm. dropped us off on the north rim, and a few days later they picked us up on the south rim. It's like, I don't know, 25, 30 miles with all the side hikes and stuff. So dead halfway through the trip on Phantom Ranch uh, on a backpacking trip, I, I proposed to my wife on the Silver Bridge over 80 feet above the Colorado River. I'm pretty sure she only said yes because she was afraid I was going to drop the ring in the Colorado <laughs> River. Um, but got her. Got you, girl. Got it. Uh, but now I got her, and I still got her. So now she can't say anything because she's got the ring now. So I got her. I got her now. Uh, wifed her up and then had a kid. So now I got her on lockdown. Um, but I've backpacked Grand Canyon. She you know, she did the High Sierra Camps Loop out in the Sierra Nevada up in Northern California. We've done a fair section of the Appalachian Trail. Mm-hmm. We've done Canyonlands. Uh, I, was ba- I was hiking last weekend up at Grayson Highlands in Virginia. So, you know, I, I, I love that. I mean, I grew up Boy Scouts. We camped, all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, I still do that stuff. I still do the hikes. I still do the backpacks. Um, last year, took our son out for his first backpacking trip. Gave him a little backpack. We hiked up. Again, Grayson Highlands, Virginia. Great spot. If you're, if you're anywhere within a few hours of it, it's a great spot. Mm-hmm. Um, but, again, it's one of those things. In the park, it's pretty overvisited. Now, if you get out of the park, you can keep hiking. There's trails outside of the park. That's when you get into the the federal land. Um, the population of people drops precipitously. The further yeah. away, the further away from the parking lot you get. 
Um, but yeah, we did that. And then um, I kind of did back in 2018, late 2018, early 2019, I bought an Overland trailer. I was like, man, that's cool. I got the Jeep. I had Reaper at the time. Reaper had a trailer hitch. I hadn't gone totally stupid with it. And we were going to Uari and Windrock a lot. I said, you know, how cool is it to be able to hook up my Overland trailer, go to Uari, go to Windrock, go to AOP, go wherever, um, drop the camper, set it up, have a base camp to sleep out of, and then go wheeling for the weekend. Mm -hmm. And that was my thing. I didn't really buy it kind of to truly Overland out of it to like, I know a lot of guys will get their vehicles and they'll tow it, and that's what they do. They just they ride hundreds of miles a day. I didn't do it for that. I did it as kind of a base camping. I'd unhook the Jeep, set it up. That's my house for the next couple of nights, and then I would mm -hmm. go wheel, wind rock, or you warrior, what have you. So I did that, but again, it's small. I mean, it was a little 10-foot box. It was a no boundaries 10.5, and we modified it a little bit, put a rooftop tent on it, put some rock lights on it. Um, actually, Jesse Cayo from Nashville actually did a bunch of stuff to it. When uh, let him have it, let him take it out for a couple months, and it came back to me, and it was like this thing's modified. He, he outlawed it up uh, <laughs> to where it is to this day. I actually, sold it to a buddy of mine. I, I had that thing until just a few months ago uh, when I sold it to a buddy of mine, and I get to see that camper still because they camp with us. But when I got rid of that camper, I got rid of the no I got rid of the little one because I was, you know, I, the wife's like, man, sure would be nice if we had a bathroom and that right there and campers, this is where it snowballs <laughs> is the most dangerous those are the most dangerous words in outdoors this is nice but it sure would be nice if it had a fill in the blank and to get out of the no boundaries was bathroom mm -hmm. so we bought a regular travel trailer camper mm -hmm. and it was nice and then it was man this is really nice but i wish we had more headroom I wish it was just a little bit bigger. I was like, well, you know what What, what makes it more headroom is a fifth wheel. So <laughs> we didn't keep that one a year, and we bought a fifth wheel. Now, I will tell you, yes, a fifth wheel is much bigger. It is more expensive. It is nicer. But we used it more in the first four weeks we had it mm -hmm. than I probably used that travel trailer in the whole time I had it. And probably yeah. just as much as I used the no boundaries. Every weekend we were going somewhere. Yeah. Every weekend. And the beauty of the of the big camper is, you know, you can go to some of these luxury RV resorts. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've got super nice, you know, fifth, you know, pads, and they've got really nice trees everywhere. They got some of them got water parks, and you can back into a river, and and they're really nice. Or, um, you know, we have a bigger one. It's it's considered a big rig, but so some places we can't get into. But there's a lot of places we can. And we went to Falls Lake in North Carolina State Park. And it was, the sites were huge. It's way more wooded. There weren't as many amenities, um, but we had the amenities in our camper. Mm -hmm. So I think a, a function of that is age. You know, I'm not 25 anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very close to 45. Um, and, you know, family. You know, I got a wife. She's all, she's younger than I am. Um, and then we've got family. You know, we've got, the, we've got our son, and he's not, he's not yet ready for 15-mile days in the backcountry. Mm -hmm. At some point he will be, but right now he's not. And, you know, we have to be able to get, we want to be able to hook up to the truck, go out, set it up, and have a place to stay for a weekend that's close to some of the stuff we want to do. So I think to, to answer your question, yeah, I think it's a natural evolution. And in talking to people like me, you know, we get to these big campgrounds and we're in a line of 100 fifth wheels. You know, we talk to each other, and they almost all have the same story. Oh, yeah, I used to do this, and I had this trailer, and then I bought this camper, and then I bought this camper, and here I am. Um, and everybody's like, oh, now you're going to get a Class A. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to go that crazy. Um, but I'm, I, I really like what we have now. But I also go back and do some of the other stuff, obviously. We still do some backpacking. We still do some camping. We still do that kind of stuff. But, yeah, I think the, the want to be comfortable – yeah, and and you're probably right. Some of the overlanders probably that probably happened because every RV resorts are being bought up and remodeled and mm -hmm. and upscaled like you would not believe. Yeah. Entire companies are are in existence now and all they're doing is either building brand new RV resorts or they're buying existing resorts and revamping them into kind of luxury resorts mm -hmm. with water parks and dog washes and these restaurants and tiki bars and lazy rivers and all this kind of stuff i just made a reservation last night for a week later in july 
to go mm-hmm. down to Hilton Head. And yeah. we're gonna we're gonna camp at Hilton Head National RV Resort. And I'm telling you, this is a resort. Oh, There's that one a giant is pool, awesome. And then a tiki <laughs> bar, and then a giant lazy river. And I'm like, yeah. this is freaking awesome. Can't wait yeah. to go. It's gonna be hot, but that's okay. Because there's a lazy river and a bar. Yep. Yes. So, yeah. yeah, years ago, a backpacking trip would have got me excited like that. Now, a camping, an RV camping trip gets me excited like that. So, yeah, yeah, I think some of it was what I said, you know, the natural progression of people getting back to work and blah, 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 blah. But there's also a segment of it, like you just said. I think people are naturally progressing. The people that did like it, they're like, hmm, this overlanding is going to be cool. But it would be nice if I had, hmm. Fill in the blank. And well, and also I think created. something that um, that contributes to that as well is it's no secret to build your vehicle out for as an overlanding rig is expensive. Um, it gets very expensive very quickly. Rooftop tents are thousands of dollars. <clears throat> Bed racks are, are high money. Suspension, and then you know you got a fridge freezer system. Now you got to upgrade your batteries. Now you got you got to install an inverter. Like. There are so many things that to do it like and to go full out and do it like you're going to spend some serious money to do that. And I think a lot of people have realized that they can go wherever they want to go in a basic F-150 with a nice camper um, and be way more comfortable doing it. So I think that that plays into it. Like if I was on a limited budget and said, hey, I can either build a truck for overlanding or I can buy a family camper and take the wife out to, like you said, Hilton Head for a week and spend the same money like i'm just gonna get a camper like that's it's way more comfortable i can take the dogs with me like I, it, it's all good um but something else i've seen and this is what kind of intrigues me and i might look into this in the future uh are the hybrid crawler hauler trailer camper i, I don't know if you've seen this but i've seen recently several people i, I think, think it's I a 36 or 40 yeah. feet uh, like a uh, fifth wheeler gooseneck and they'll drop a fifth wheel camper on the front, bolt that down or weld that down to the trailer, however you need to, and then roll their Jeep or off-roading rig behind that. And to me, that's awesome. That is cool. I've seen that. I've also seen people taking full school buses, cutting them in half, and schoolie. building building the front out as a schoolie and the back half as a trailer. Um, you're only going to go 40 miles an hour. <laughs> if that's how you want to see the country is at 40 miles an hour, then be my guest. But no, I've seen some uh, homemade crawler haulers that are that are really really cool. That I you could potentially pull those into a campsite as well and have your wheel and rig with you. Well, you absolutely can. Uh, I mean, it's basically just a gooseneck that the front half somebody takes a box off of a camper. You know, anywhere from I guess anywhere from like a sixteen to maybe a twenty foot box off of a camper, mm-hmm. which now you've got because you can still keep all of your RV type stuff. Your mm-hmm. electrical hookup. You can still keep your sewer hookup. So you can go to some of these sites and you have tanks. You have freshwater tanks, gray tanks. So you can boondock. If you don't have that stuff, you can go into a camper, a campsite, a KOA, something like that. You can hook up like a full RV, but then you've got the back 20 feet or so on the gooseneck available for your crawler. I think that's a really cool idea. Um, it, it's not something, unfortunately, that's like companies aren't making them yet. So it's going to require mm-hmm. you to get pretty, um, we'll say, creative. Yeah. Um, but I like that, uh, because toy haulers aren't big enough. They're not big enough inside or, or to haul, you know, full on haulers or crawlers, unless you're doing well, them. There is side one company sides. that I've seen. I want to say they're out of Arizona doom sport. I want to say is the name I was looking at them recently. Um, they are building toy haulers that are reinforced on the door and the back half of the frame to put a full size rig with full width axles in. Um, they had some video of, uh, jk's tj's um and then also side by sides and stuff like that so people are starting to move towards that i don't know how many other companies are reinforcing toy haulers to be able to carry a jeep in the back like that that's the only one that i've seen but yeah most toy haulers are only side by side so i can definitely see why people are wanting to be able to bring all of it out and have you know instead of overlanding per se but uh being able to go camp at the a wheeling park or go from destination to destination and do hardcore wheeling and then be very comfortable um when you stay at night yeah you are right it is dune sport i just kind of looked at it while you were talking um I, that is that is super cool and you know again if i could do that you know i see a lot of toy haulers in campgrounds just because everybody's hauling around mostly golf carts mm-hmm. um, but then when you go to like windrock and stuff like that you see them hauling around side by sides mm-hmm. um 
for me, for the Jeep, I, I, it's a it's a four door vehicle. Like if I had my four by or whatever, I'd put it outside. I'd like your idea better. Yeah, just leave the outside open, um, so that if it is muddy or nasty or it's got a leak or something, I'm not having to smell that right. in my in my crawler right. hauler. And then taking that box off of there and still having all the amenities of a of a travel trailer, mm-hmm. um, but then having that extended deck on there to have that. I think that's cool. I think that's real cool. But again. <clears throat> because there's not a lot of companies building those, it requires some ingenuity and some. Mm-hmm. But I think you know if you buy that stuff right, and and you're able to do some of the work yourself, you could probably save. I would think you could save a ton of money. I would think. probably. So that, that could be that could be a really cool idea. But as long as it gets you outside, man, I don't care. Like, do that. Buy a fifth wheel. Buy a toy hauler. Buy a freaking. I mean, even these. You know, I said the no boundaries. There's companies like Ember out there. There's companies like. Uh, that like no boundaries. Our pods making them in uh, Ibex. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there that are making what we're talking about that natural progression. You know, mm-hmm. when I was when I bought my no boundaries, that was the first year they were made. I think no boundaries started in 2019, and I think I bought it in late 18 or early 19. It was one of the first ones here in North Carolina. And at that time, they weren't going over what they called a 16 series. So they had a 10 and a 16. That was it. And they were roughly 10 to 12 feet for the 10 series. And they were roughly 16 to 18 feet for the 16 series. Now they've got an 18, a 19, and a 20. The 20 now has like a fold-down bed in the front. It's like a Murphy bed. It's got a full-on bathroom. It's got a kitchen. It's got a bar stool. But it still has this off-road independent uh, suspension. So you mm. can take it You can take it to a little rougher a little rougher places. Like you mentioned, NC105 is one. I was just there a couple weeks ago. I took my Chevy ZR2 up it. Uh, it's gotten rutted. And yeah. good luck finding a camp spot. We went on a yep. Saturday, and I basically just ran up there. We were already up there. We had done some river tubing and some stuff, and we were camping. And I said, "Let's, you know, we're here." And we were literally at a brewery a mile from the south side of the entrance 105, where it goes from pavement to gra- gravel going down from the south end. And mm-hmm. I said, well, "Let's just go up there." And and we had Gaia. I said, "Let's just make some spots, some notes of some spots." But um, it's real grown up. There's not a lot of – I found maybe seven or eight spots that had what I would consider good views. Now, mm-hmm. there was 30 other ones in there, 40 other ones in there, and I would say all of the ones that I would consider good spots were obviously taken. They're yeah. gone. Probably had been gone since the day before. And then probably two-thirds of the other ones um, were taken with about half of the ones kind of on the wood side. Yeah. At some points on that, it's open on both sides. But the trees were really green. The trees were really filled in. It's really green up there. It's not, I don't think it's what some people think it is. A lot of people think they're just going to get up on this cool ridge road and just see for miles in every direction. It's mostly trees. Yeah. <laughs> I got news for you, people. Um, so for me, I don't understand why it's as big of a thing as it is, unless you're one of the lucky ones to get one of the super cool campsites. It's a 20 mile gravel road that comes out at Linville Falls. On the north yeah. side, it comes out at Linville Falls. On the south side, it's down by Lake James and um, and that area down there, um, which is a cool little area. Um, but I, I don't I don't look at it as a big overlanding destination. But it it is like you said, it's on the groups, it's on Facebook groups everywhere because it's easily accessible and pretty much anybody can get to it. So everybody just kind of flocks to it, mm-hmm. um, which we all probably need to be reminded that's what got Teleco shut down and that's what got Richland road shut down. So yep. be mindful of that over user people. So I don't yeah. know what the fix for that is other than for people like us to stay off of it. If we know better, just stay off of it. Don't go, yeah. go find something else. If you're adventurous, go find something else. Get on Gaia, get on, get on the other mm-hmm. groups, get on Onyx, go find some other stuff, be adventurous, go prepared so that you can, you know, come what may you're, you're, you're set and go out and, Go find something else to do. Go yeah, find there, and then keep that crap to yourself. <laughs> yeah, pick up your trash. But there are yeah. plenty of other places around 105, old 105, that are still awesome, awesome little trips. Um, I'm not going to name drop too many of them here, but if you go on Onyx or Gaia, or Venza, any of those, you'll be able to find st- for- forest roads and state roads, unmaintained state roads, rather. Um, that are that are fun. They're gravel roads. It's not going to be anything technical whatsoever, uh, but they will offer some pretty cool views and camp spots. So, 
keep those in mind. Um, maybe that we'll just, we'll talk about those in a future episode, but I don't want those to get overrun too. So I don't want, I don't mean to like exactly. gatekeep, uh, but at the same time, like I'm tired of seeing our really cool spots getting shut down by idiots. And uh, so. No, that's well, a thing. That's a thing. Well, we will conclude that segment of the show. Um, the last thing we got to do is you mentioned doing some mailbag questions. Um, I don't have any questions today because those two were mailbag. kind of like in, uh, hybrid in between mailbag and, um, you know, full on podcast topics. Um, but I do want to try some uh, rapid fire Q&A with you. Lightning round. A little bit of lightning round. The lightning um, round. Let people understand and uh, know who we are again. So Let's do it. What do you got for me? Question number one. What got you into off-roading? Uh, I grew up as a pretty redneck little kid in southwestern Kentucky. And that's what we <laughs> did. I mean, it started on, yeah. you know, five-speed mountain bikes that we spray-painted that our parents yelled at us for doing that. Uh, but we thought they looked cool. Looking back on it now, they look like absolute crap. And then if you start living that lifestyle when you're a kid, I mean, you just naturally progress to it. But I spent a lot of time in cut down cornfields as a kid. I spent a lot of time on farms. Um, I said it a lot earlier. I did a lot of Boy Scouts. So we did a lot of camping as a kid. And but that's all on your two feet. And when you realize you can kind of do that stuff, but now you can do it faster and go more places because you have a vehicle. Yeah, I think a natural progression into off road is your is your next step. So I don't yeah. I don't really remember a time before five years old that I didn't I wasn't spending time a, a decent amount of time outside. Yeah, that's the same thing for me. I grew up outside and grew up on whatever bike I had. I mean, just whatever. I spent as much time outdoors as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was mean, forced this, to. I didn't, that was my yeah, generation. I, I mean, I was born in 1980, man. It was the yeah. get your butt outside. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see you until the lights come on. Because mm -hmm. if you try to come home before the street lights come on, front door is probably going to be locked. <laughs> yep. If you need a drink, hit the water hose. Yep. I, I still remember I bought. It wasn't a very good idea. And I'm probably going to show my age here. I still remember going to Walmart and buying a Discman. Now, I had Walkmans. I am that old. and But we would go and the Discman back in those days, how good your your Discman was, was how much anti-skip you had. Mm -hmm. <laughs> was it three seconds? Was it five? Oh, my God, it was ten. And we would literally take those and find some way to zip tie them, duct tape them, whatever, to our handlebars. And we would put headphones in and like that was the original iPad man or iPod man. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, you got some skipping going on, but that's why we bought the anti skip. And if you could get a discman that you could ride around the neighborhood and it wasn't there, then you were you were pretty you're pretty you're legit. Pretty good. It was all about how many feet per second our BB guns could shoot and what was mm -hmm. our anti skip on our Sony discmans. Yeah. See, and I'm, I'm really thankful that I got to grow up on the tail end of that. Uh, my family couldn't afford any kind of video game consoles, even though they were out, we couldn't afford them. So I spent a lot of time outside drinking from the fire hose, shooting each other with BB guns and paintball guns. I still um, have the scars. I, I would ride for miles on the bike. And so that naturally got me into, um, my first, well, I guess my second real vehicle, uh, was a 95 YJ and man, I, every, every illegal spot in Gaston County, <laughs> North Carolina, uh, been there, done there that. Was, if there was a, a power line trail or any kind of trail, this was before every single plot of land was a subdivision. Um, there were still woods. There were still things to do. I got in so much trouble riding around in places I shouldn't have been in. I got cops called on me a couple times, but I loved it. And even as much of a piece of junk as that YJ was, like it brought me into places and it started the uh, started the the obsession. I guess is what it is. Um, but that leads me to number two. What was your first four by four? A old like ninety three, I think, which was it was newer at the time. Um, but after I learned how to drive, now it wasn't. I learned to drive on other people's vehicles, um, and you know I mean mentioned it before. I learned how to drive stick on a uh, old manual like F one hundred in a cut down cornfield behind the farm where I used to work in the summers. <laughs> And I was, I don't know, 10 or 11, something like that. And then a few years on, and, you know, because I had to learn how to drive a tractor there. I had to learn how to drive the truck around the farm. You know, we had to back up trucks to trailers to load the hogs, all that kind of stuff. So, and that was in Kentucky. So nobody cared if you drove a truck without a license as a kid. Child labor mm -hmm. was fine. I think I made like 50 bucks a week. <laughs> and I thought that was cool because at Friday yeah. I got my 50 bucks and we went to the roller rink, man. Um, 
Roller Dome, Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Shout out. I don't even know if it's there anymore. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that was where I kind of learned it. And then when I got official, um, one of my dad's friends at the time took me in his old Chevy S10 out to uh, a little spot in East Tennessee called Cade's Cove. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who know it, we sit out now, now, years, you know, 30 years later, we set up at Cade's Cove every year as Outlaw Off-Road for Jeep Invasion. We'll be there again this year. Um, but yeah, my first experience with it was probably 1993 or 1994 with this old green and white Chevy pickup because he lived in Townsend, which is really close to Cade's Cove. It basically is Cade's Cove. And he said, well, it's really hilly and the speed limit's like a weird number. It's like 11. So he's like, well, this is where you're going to learn. And we're going to stop you on hills and you got to learn how to go and stop. And I was not allowed to, I didn't even drive an automatic until my mom took me out in her automatic minivan or something to prepare me for my driving test. And I was already 15 at that point. Yeah. But I had driven manual for like four years before that off and on. So, um, and then after that, my first vehicle that I bought that was a four by four was a Ford Ranger that I bought after that. And Good I did offer that one. I had a Danger <laughs> Ranger, vinyl seats, no That's air awesome. conditioning, manual roll up windows. But that little sucker was so light, it would stay on top of everything so I could do whatever I want with it. And I didn't do much to it, and then I ended up trading that one in later on another newer Ford Ranger, and I built that one. That one got lifted, mud tires. That one I took out every weekend to every illegal trail in eastern North Carolina I could find back in those days. But that was, <laughs> what was that, yeah. 20, 25 years ago, something like that. And then I got into Jeeps mm -hmm. and other stuff. But, yeah, it started for me. It was started with two Ford Rangers. Nice. I still love Ford Rangers. I still love uh, those things. Like the I new, said, mine the was a uh, Raptor Ranger is pretty slick. Oh, yeah. I love those. Mm -hmm. um, mine was a YJ that progressed into TJ's and another YJ, then a JK, and then another JK, and then a JL. Now we're back to the LJ. Um, yeah, first ever 4x4 was a YJ. Total piece of junk. It was a 95 four-cylinder YJ manual. It was broken down half the time. Hey, man, but square that, headlights matter. Sometimes. <laughs> no, they don't. No, they don't. Uh, that leads me into next question. Uh what is your dream build? Hmm. I mean, everything else be damned, no budget, no nothing. Just what's my absolute dream build if I could have All anything? Mm -hmm. Trophy truck. Yes. Yep. <laughs> trophy truck. Um, I, yeah. I would love to have Minzy's Red Bull trophy truck. That thing mm, just speaks to yeah. me. Uh, but even, even when Baldwin had his, that first, when he went with Toyota for those several years, Mm -hmm. And that when he was with Toyota and Monster at the same time, that purple and silver Tundra with the uh, when he was sponsored by Toyota and Rigid. Yeah, and I think he still is. But this one, it was the, the Toyota. He filmed that YouTube series he did on um, recoil Cuba. Yeah, recoil yeah. Um, that that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a thousand oh, horsepower, yes. <laughs> triangulation, 30 inches of wheel travel, um, man, 140 like you're on pavement in the desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, dream build, um, trophy truck. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm with you there. I, uh, I, I although, don't know what else I'd want. Yeah, I mean, I am sort of dreaming about building my dream rig right now. It's the, the LJ is something that I've wanted since I was 16. And I'm finally, it's finally getting to the point. I know I'm the LJ procrastinator here, but it's finally getting to a point where it's getting done and it's Everybody getting done the way I want it. it done. We all see and it. And it's, it's a... Yeah, <laughs> but the uh, the LJ is something that I've wanted ever since I saw an LJ when I was 16. I was like, that is the coolest thing in the world. Now I own one. So now that's becoming my dream rig. Uh, aside from that budget aside, yeah, I think I'm with you. Trophy truck or some sort of uh, Ultra 4 spec race car would be freaking phenomenal. Um, I mean, I wouldn't mind a I, Campbell car. Whew, just saying. No. no, I mean, let's go. <laughs> I, you know. Those are those are awesome to me. Like I, you know, I could see that people would be like, "Oh, my dream car is a Ferrari or it's a Mustang." And you know, way back when, I would have told you in, in '69 Eleanor, uh, mm -hmm. the Mustang Eleanor from uh, Gone in 60 Seconds, still a badass car. I'd still rock it, but it's not my yeah. dream anymore. As as more, right. you know, that's it is definitely a trophy truck for going fast. And if I wanted something in the rocks, I mean, I could just buy it. If I if I could do that, I could just buy a two car garage and buy one of Shannon's cars. Yeah, even absolutely. that new ride that Lauren's got that IFS IRS with the Fox Live valve and Ooh, yes. that thing is a freaking spaceship, mm -hmm. and uh, Paul Wolf's forty four hundred car Mario Kart. I love it. <laughs> that is I my favorite it. Ultra Four car. I'm not gonna lie, Mario Kart. Yeah, is my favorite. My son loved, and and he and you know Paul knew what he was doing when he did that paint oh, graphic scheme. 
mm-hmm. all the kids are like, it's Mario Kart. It's Mario mm-hmm. Brothers. I love that freaking car. Yeah. And the spoiler, yeah. it looks like something from Mario Kart. I think it's awesome. Yeah. I love it. It's Good awesome. Job, Paul. UFO buggies yeah. in general are just super cool. Yep. Very, um, very cool stuff. All right. I know you've hit a lot of trails in your lifetime, but what is your bucket list trail you still want to hit? That I still that oh that I haven't hit yet that I still Correct. it's kind of still on my mm-hmm. bucket list. Um, I've got I'm gonna go with two only because one is only like 500 yards long, um, and they're actually both pretty short. One I've seen and been on, I just haven't run it, and one I have not been on and I've not run it, but I've watched enough YouTube to know I want to run it. That one would be 21 Road in Colorado, um, but I have to get my mind right again for going back into my body damage days, and I'm kind of out of my body damage days. So I just don't know if that one's going to happen. I, I don't know. Maybe when the race car is retired and I do stupid things with it, because it's already got a ton of body damage, that might be the time to do that. And the other one is Carnage Canyon. Um, yeah, right up, right, I mean, literally right outside of Buena Vista, Colorado. Super short, but it is super stupid. Um, I've walked on that a little bit because I've, I've run Chinaman Gulch before. Yeah. And I actually ran that with an event where we had to go over to – because you can walk between the two at certain points. Or they, they basically mm-hmm. touch each other. Um, so, yeah, those two, I would say 21 Road and um, and and Carnage Canyon. There's others I want to run, but those kind of those are on my – if you want to know my, like, bucket list, like, I have to find a way to run these before I'm no longer on the face of Earth, though, those are the two. Those are two. Because it used to be Rubicon and Fordyce and all that, but I did that. You did them. That, which definitely led up to the billing. So now those, so yeah. So now the, the trails have changed, and they may yeah, change but, again. Who knows? And that might be an, an episode for the for the future of talking about full on bucket list, you know, rank, you know, top five bucket list trails. Kind of give some people I mean, some uh, some well ideas to look out for other than uh, Moab. And if you do ten, I can go all the way across the country with you. Let's do it. I'm, I'm down for it. All right. Well, just like that, that is, show idea was born. <laughs> this is how we get content. I guess you guys. That's right. Hey, it happens. Um, yeah, so that is it for today. That is all I've got, Doug. What else do you got for me? Uh, we well, we covered all the events. I think the only thing I would say on that is make sure that everybody we we are almost full on trail days. Mm-hmm. Um, you can go sign up for that event. Uh, that is a hundred percent free for us. We don't we are not charging anybody to go. That is a donation as all that is required to Hero Off Road. Um, to learn more about that, you can go to the Outlaw Off Road. That is the Outlaw Off Road, like the Ohio State University dot com slash forward slash trail days. The Outlaw Off Road dot com forward slash trail days. You can find all the information there. There is the link to donate to Hero Off Road. Please, please, please make sure that you are using that link. That is a link that Hero created specifically for us to be able to track who donated versus who signed up. So we know. We also have some people that have just done straight donations, and we've also had. We've got a couple of spots left still for people that couldn't make it but wanted to make sure that a veteran could go. If there was a veteran that wanted to go but could not do the donation or was not able to do the donation, we have spots. We have a couple of spots left for that. We've got people that have done that. So, look, I'm going to donate either way, but if I can if I can fund a veteran to go that couldn't otherwise be able to go, then that is my spot. I think we had f- four of those, and we have two or three left. So mm-hmm. either way, that donation is going to Hero Off-Road. It's going to be a huge, huge influx of cash for them, thankfully, which is what we wanted. Uh, but then we're also, you know, side benefit is it's just going to be an awesome event. So starting with the kickoff party at Crafters Brew in Oak Ridge on Thursday the 12th and then Wheeling on Friday the 13th and Friday the 14th. I'm sure some people will stick around and do some little stuff on the 15th, which is fine, but the official event kicks off on the evening of the 12th and then goes to the 13th and 14th. So um, go to the website. Get on there. Get signed up. That is limited. We can't have a million people out on the trails there. Um, Windrock has been very good to us that they're giving us kind of our own event and our own space. We've got the pavilion back in the back area that's just ours. Um, so pretty excited about that. Uh, when you d- For those of you who have already signed up or you're going to sign up, we're going to be reaching out to everybody to join a Facebook group where all of the details that aren't there for the general public are going to be. So that's, that's coming up. And then, of course, more details to follow, but we've got the Outlaw Offered Recovery Class with Warren Industries and Factor 55 at Uwari National Forest uh, in November. That is coming up on Saturday, November the 2nd. Uh, I thought we were going to have a race to talk about for Labor Day weekend um, from Ultra 4, but it looks like everything I know as of right now, as of the posting of this video, I don't know that Ultra 4 is going to be at Crandon this year, which is Ooh, pretty dang wow. disappointing. 
Yeah, that is, pretty dang um, disappointing. Most yeah, people know we've kind of – I haven't raced with Ultra 4 as much this year because of um, – they kind of made the decision – you know, they had some drama last year with getting bought or sold or whatever happened there, and that was that was a fiasco. But then I think, you know, Cameron King and Dave Cole stepped back in, and they were going to try to kind of revive the series. They brought in John Goodby from NorCal, I think. Um, from all From everything I've heard, super good dude. But one of the things they did was to cut media coverage and marketing. They cut mm-hmm. it big time. And for us, um, you know, we're not we're not racers. I'm not a race car driver. I mean, you know, racing for us is marketing. It's testing, and we need that marketing to be able to go out and keep doing it, and to be able to you know to be able to go to sponsors and be able to help fund that team to do it at the level that we want to do it. And when they cut that, you know, we went to Kentucky. There was no live feed. They went to Indiana, which we did not go to because of that. That was the only reason we didn't go. For anybody, I've had people ask. That was the only reason we didn't go. Um, it's like that whole picks or it didn't happen thing. <laughs> there, mm-hmm. was, there wasn't going to be a lot of picks, so it didn't happen. So we didn't go, and we were looking forward to Crandon. But now I've I started looking into Crandon to make plans to be at Crandon in less than two months, and it's not on the Ultra Four website anymore. And um, mm. it is looking like from the people that I talked to, it is either not going to happen, or it could possibly be a forty four hundred only, no forty eights, no forty fives, no forty sixes, mm. no forty nines, even possibly. Not sure about the logistics behind that. Don't know. Not going to speculate. But it looks like right now that Ultra 4 may not be at Crandon, which would then mean it's basically time for us to tool up because some people already know, but we've we, I'm not really made it a secret that we are going to be going into the Jeep Speed race scene next year with 46.99. We may mm-hmm. be changing to 27.99, whatever. But we are going to go into the Jeep Speed uh, racing series, which is basically all in the desert stuff. Yeah. Um, we may even it may even be a deal where we go to King of the Hammers, but we race the Desert Challenge in Jeep speed, and mm-hmm. we don't run the actual King of the Hammers as an Ultra Four vehicle. I'd still be there to support, you know, other teams, teammates, run pits, run comms, you know, do sure. whatever. Um, and and maybe I put myself out there if somebody needs an emergency backup as a co driver or driver, whatever. I'll be there for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that's kind of what it's looking like now, and and racing stuff instead like the Mint, you know, iconic race, the Mint Four Hundred out in uh, Las Vegas, running the Baja Five Hundred, running Vegas to Reno, maybe running like Park or something like that, but doing all of those races, which are from a marketing standpoint would actually be better because way more eyes on them, way mm-hmm. more eyes on those kinds of races, especially the Mint Baja, and then again the plan right now is to run the Baja One Thousand as well in uh in jeep speed and see what we can do there so a lot of stuff Absolutely. coming for next year um unfortunately this year kind of you know didn't really go the way anybody wanted with ultra four just because of some of the back office type of stuff but hope they get that figured out uh it's a good i think it could be a really really good series um if they get some stuff turned around i don't i don't know that they will i have no idea certainly hope that they do i'd like to I'd like to go race with those guys a couple of times a year they've got some they've had in in their history some really good places that they've raced um and and even some places i haven't been to that i've looked at that it looked really fun um so we'll see we'll see what happens there but it doesn't look like ultra four is much on our plate for the rest of the year we'll see if that changes crandon could come back on certainly hope that it does i love crandon and then um you know fingers crossed for nationals that are supposed to happen um in oklahoma i think in october we'll see we'll see how that goes uh but if it doesn't we'll figure out some cool stuff to do with the race car we'll take it out some stuff supposedly right now the race car is supposed to be a jeep tastic we'll rip some laps out there we'll go do the barrel racing um you know we've got some stuff planned for the race car to get it out there and get it in front of people and show people what that thing's capable of for the rest of the year so um yeah that is all i have (laughs) <laughs> so I think <laughs> I think that's probably how we'll wrap it up for for yeah. the new format. Again, a little bit longer episode, but we wrapped everything into one episode now. Mm-hmm. You know, bringing everybody up to uh, up to date on current events, talking about what's going on in the industry, talking about what's going on with us, and then doing the lightning round slash mailbag type stuff. Um, next week we'll do we'll actually do some mailbag. I know I've got some questions, but not really enough to hit. You know, we want to do four or five of those. So we'll scour the Facebooks and all that. And last week was a holiday week, too, getting back into it, getting going, and then trying to get this film to put it out um, today, Friday, to get it done. So, um, But I like the format. I like what we're doing. I like the new visual. I like the new look. We've got even more stuff that we're going to be doing. So definitely looking forward to bringing you guys just higher quality and the highest quality content that we can bring you 
um, you know, at least from a podcast standpoint. I mean, let's right. be honest, we're not we're not professionals. But uh, for those of you that are watching, that are listening, as always, we thank each and every one of you, uh, wherever you find us, whether it's Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google, YouTube, whatever, wherever. We appreciate each and every one of you. And as we kind of talked about at the beginning, I had no idea we were at seven seventy two hundred listens or whatever. So um, that's awesome. That is awesome, yeah. and that is not because of us. That is because of you guys actually willing to tune in yeah. and listen to us and hear what we have to say and 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 watch and or listen whichever way, whichever way you do that. So, um, with that, we'll leave it there. Do please make sure like, comment, subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that little notification bell. Uh, that helps us out a lot, and we'll also notify you when the new episodes drop. Um, currently, we are dropping every episode now uh, every Friday with our our, our new format um, starting this Friday. Um, so that's what we will be looking forward to doing in the future. I think that's going to be, uh, I think that's going to be the thing for us going forward. I also have two or three interviews, uh, that I'm working <coughs> on getting scheduled, uh, but I wanted to get the new format, the new layout, the new visuals going before we did that. Um, so we do have some of those coming up and I'm working on getting an event organizer, uh, for a, a pretty good event in the Southeast to come on and do, um, another episode. So, and I've had a couple more reach out, so. We'll see how we can get that scheduled, and we'll fit in one or one of those a month or something like that to go in um, to the new format. So, yeah, Absolutely. that's all I've got, Caleb. If that's all for you, if you don't have anything else, um, that is it for me, sir. I think it's time to sign out. Again, thank you, everyone, and we will see you on the next episode. You've been listening to the Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off Road. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time don't follow us you're not gonna make it